As followers of Jesus in the midst of another polarizing election season, we don't have the choice to walk away from our responsibility to change broken policies that are breaking our neighbors or to end relationships with our family and friends who might think differently than we do. That's why this season of the Everyday Peacemaking Podcast is exploring how we are to engage politics as citizens of the kingdom of God and the United States. It's going to be hard and messy, but it's holy work, and we're here for it all. Thanks for joining us for Peace in Politics, becoming everyday peacemakers in and outside of the voting booth. Okay, on the podcast today, we have my uh, longtime buddy, Shane Claiborne, who I am thrilled to be with because he always brings the the hope and the fire and the hard stuff all together, and he does in this episode. Yeah, oh my gosh. So my first experience of Shane Claiborne was um, I somebody had shared some some thing that he had, some place where he had spoken, and like a clip of his, his speaking, and he said, which I think is a line that we often attribute to him, like, what if Jesus actually meant it? Like, yeah. he said that phrase. I mean, he said that phrase, like, I was right in the middle of my, like, um, like moving from sort of the evangelical framework that I had into a more Anabaptist mm-hmm. framework. And, I, and that was really, I was, like, reading the Bible from a Jesus-centered lens. And so hearing him say that, I was like, wait, like, there are actual Christians who are, like, talking like this. Yes. And I just followed him ever since so it's been over a decade and i've been grateful for his leadership and i cannot believe that we got to chat with him for the podcast today so good all right everybody listen in Okie doke. Here we are with our friend and colleague in the work of peace and all things Jesus and justice, Shane Claiborne. It's good to have you with us, my friend. Great to be here. So fun. I mean, it's always boring when we hang out with you. So I presume if you're listening, <laughs> just be ready for a boring conversation. You know, tune out now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, it's, it, it brings me, it's so funny, Shane, because when we're together, we have fun, but it's also always around like heavy stuff. I mean, we... We've been in Standing Rock together, navigating blizzards and marching after uh, around in New in New York after one, yet another police killing of a black man and all these different things that matter. But at the same time, this spirit of community and levity, and we got to trust that there's something better out there. So let's get after it together. That's right. Um, and it's that spirit I really appreciate about you. And I know you're coming out of that right now. I mean, you just have been walking with a friend who's a pastor to someone who was on death row and was executed yesterday. And so you carry that spirit of heaviness and of hope all together. Um, so even with that being said, Shane, I, I, like, the first question we have for you is these have been a funky few years. Uh, they've been challenging to say the least. Uh, they've been, they forced us to get creative. That we're holding on to this heaviness and this hope. And as a form of introduction, would you share a bit about how you're showing up in the midst of that in your work and in your personal life to get mm-hmm. us cooking here? Yeah, well, Oshida and John, it's good to be with both of you. I love Global Immersion. I love everything y'all are doing. Uh, honored to be a part of the conversation. Uh, well, I mean, to just put it all out there, I spent the last year or so living on a school bus turned into a solar powered tiny house with a compost and toilet. Booyah. And uh, I can t- tell you how that works if you want to know. Um, but, uh, you know, but I also um, we've been on the north side of Philadelphia for 25 years. That's part of why we uh, took took a little bit of time to hang out with our family and um, do something a little different. Back, we're back landed here. Uh, and I, I mean, it is an incredible time to be alive. I think, you know, if you believe that on the darkest nights, you can see the brightest stars. Um, <laughs> and here we are, help us, Lord. Uh, but you know, a lot of things did not stop during the pandemic. Um, mm. uh, racism didn't stop, police brutality didn't stop, uh, uh, domestic violence didn't stop. Our gun violence uh, hit the highest rates that it's been in decades. Philadelphia set the, the record last year for the most gun deaths in the history of our city. Uh, 
uh, in many places, executions didn't stop. So, you know, um, injustice doesn't uh, uh, pause for a pandemic. Um, right. And while we wanted to be, you know, careful and cautious, we also wanted to be present. Uh, and, you know, our community, yeah. I'm looking out the, the window right now, and we're still provided COVID testing and vaccinations for folks, especially people on the street. So we do an outdoor clinic. So if folks have a shopping cart or a, a pet with them or something, they're still able to be treated. And um, we, we've got a fridge on the on the sidewalk that says the community fridge, take what you need and leave the rest for somebody else. Uh, so we're trying to, you know, be present in new ways. Um, but it's been a challenging season for sure. You bet. Mm, yeah. Grateful for that consistent witness. I think that is a good call because I think the tendency has been oftentimes in these moments to just withdraw. Be like, ugh, this is a season we got to hunker down and kind of take care of our own, which there's a necessity to that too, but we can't close our eyes to our neighbors and and the world around us. Um, Let me offer a few framing thoughts and then Oshita take it away. Um, Shane, we're talking about peace and politics and we want for the sake of this conversation and for all of you listening in to continually talk about some definitions and assumptions we're making and what we mean by peace and politics. So uh, three, three words we want to hit on quickly. One, when we talk about peace, we're talking about the holistic repair of relationships. Yeah. So it's not it's some esoteric idea. It's actually broken stuff getting fixed in relation to myself, to my relationships and systemically around us. Um, we're talking about peacemaking. We're talking about not a passive uh, maintaining of the status quo, but a proactive movement toward conflict with tools to heal and to transform. So it's a it, peacemaking is a movement toward. Yeah. And thirdly, politics We're not talking partisan, red and blue. We're talking about how do we order society? Every society has to decide how we order ourselves as kingdom citizens. How do we participate in that ordering with values of the kingdom as part of this nation state called the United States? So that's some stuff, Shane, even for you as you're thinking about this, how we're talking about peace and politics. Rashida, you want to kick us off? So now that we are thinking about it that way, I think a lot of people are burnt out. (laughs) and over thinking about politics. I think the 2016 election and all the things that follow the Trump administration and and then, you know, when Biden got elected, I just feel like there's a lot of, we've just spent a lot of energy thinking about elections, thinking about politics. And so midterm elections are coming up and I just know that there are some people who are just weary and being like, and just at a point of like, why even care? Why is this even an important thing for me to engage with? Um, And so why would, how would you answer that question? If somebody were to say to you, Shane, why should I care about the midterm elections? Is that even a practice of peacemaking? How would you respond to that? Well, it's hard to get excited about politics, but it's easy for me to get excited about love Mm. and, and loving my neighbor as myself requires uh, caring about the, the, the policies that affect their lives. So, you know, I, I think that it's easy to, to get discouraged with the two-party system and the culture wars and the stale rhetoric, the same excuses that we've heard over and over. And in some ways, uh, dissatisfaction with our politicians is at, a, is, is at an all-time high. Yeah. But what I also saw was a stat that said the reelection rate is also really high. So the mm-hmm. same people get reelected, even though we're less and less content yeah. with it. Yeah. almost everything else. You find a new company or you find a new uh, employee or a new, uh, you know, something. But we, we have a hard time voting them out. There's an article I saw that said, uh, how will this generation change Washington when they hate it so much? Mm. Mm. So it's easy to understand how people tap out. I mean, even now, uh, the, I was at the White House for the signing of a gun bill that is, you know, the it, it is said that this is the most significant gun violence legislation we've seen in 30 years. And I mean, this thing was hard to get excited about. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, okay. Doesn't even talk about, you know, assault rifles or yeah. limiting number of handguns or you know so many different things but i think that it will save some lives it won't save enough lives and there's a whole lot of other things that we need to do but i think you know i've come to think of my the the way i engage politics or sheeta for me at least is damage control i'm not mm. looking for a messiah 
uh, I found the Messiah, but I am trying to um, elect people that are going to do the least amount of damage. And that's consistent with my own like kind of theology. Um, you know, when Ephesians says that we're up against not flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. And I see those principalities and powers very alive in our political systems today. I think Donald Trump unleashed some of the worst demonic forces of racism and white supremacy that uh, they were there. They just, uh, they came out. Woo! I mean, like, yes. I mean, so, yeah. so we're seeing some of that. And I think, you know, what I really see, too, is that there are a couple of different forces that are at war right now. Uh, and I could name them as love and fear, right? That there, yes. uh, We've got a choice between fear and love. And uh, scripture says perfect love casteth out fear. I also think that fear pushes away love. Mm -hmm. They're like opposing magnets, right? So you can't um, try to hold them in the same space. And I think our, we're faced in this country with uh, w which side are we on? Are we on the side of love or fear? And when fear is compelling our policies, we do really terrible things. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, that's been true throughout history. When it's fear that's driving us, um, we do some of the most vicious things that yeah. we can imagine. Um, so I, I'm hoping we'll choose love. Uh, and, 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 you know, on immigration, on gun violence, on how we think about justice uh, and the death penalty. Um, I think there's so many different issues. Health care, you know, like, are we going to have this fear of scarcity that there's just not enough to go yeah. around or this trust that that God's love is perfect and God didn't make too many people or uh, an inefficient amount of stuff. But we we uh we, we've got to choose love and, and choose faith that god knows what god's doing and and didn't mess up and make too few resources for too or, or too many people mm. so what i'm what i'm hearing you say is to what, what might be helpful for some to think of using their vote as a practice of peace is not getting maybe so hung up on do they fully agree with every single candidate? Does every single candidate get them excited, makes them want to go out and canvas? But like, which of the candidates stand for love or which one, which of the candidates would, would create or give more opportunities for people to experience like care and love? Like, and, and which of the candidates are trading on fear and sort of looking at it from those two paradigms as opposed to like red or blue or things like that is that what I'm hearing you say yeah and I you know I, I want to be clear too that I don't think there's anybody that's perfectly uh fearless and mm -hmm. only driven by love right that's one place Martin Luther not every place but one place Martin Luther got it right is that there's you know a sinner and a saint at war in every one of us and we right choose in every moment who we're going to be but I think that um right now it's very clear that there are some issues that I think an election does make a really big deal. For, for, for example, um, I'm not a single issue person, but like in governor races, governors hold the power of life and death when it comes to the death penalty. Yeah. It, it shouldn't be that way, but one person can decide who lives and dies when it comes to capital punishment. Um, there's other things like, you know, jobs and affordable housing that I think we have compelling and competing um, ideas of what's best for people. Um, but, you know, I, I think some of these things, um, an election really can make a difference. Um, and, you know, even like something like abortion, I care deeply about reducing the number of abortions. Yeah. Um, I also think that we've got some false narratives out there of what is actually going to be effective in doing that. You know, when you, when you research it a little bit more, or, you know, people, you know, that have been faced with that terrible decision, you see that, you know, that the, the top reason for having an abortion is uh, financial stability and not feeling like you, you have the resources uh, to raise a child um, or another child, um, childcare, healthcare, you know, 
all of these paid leave, all of these things, like if we really want to reduce abortions, there's ways to do it that I don't think we just immediately go to trying to legislate and make it illegal. Same with guns. I think we can have common sense gun laws that save lives. That doesn't mean I think we should make every gun illegal under every circumstance or something. I think we could just, we, the, the question I'm always asking is, what will allow life to flourish? Oh, so I love that question when I'm looking at different policies. And I also love what you just said about the, the like governors and sort of the power that they have in, the, in their role and function. I think we often, and I think this is pro- part and parcel with living, like having a Western kind of worldview where I think that we, we sensationalize things and we, we, things are much bigger and grander and then we get overwhelmed. Meaning like we think politics and we think the presidential election or we think politics or abortion and we think Supreme Court. We don't think politics and we think school board or right. mayor and we don't think, you know, policies or, or abortion the, the, the girl next door, the teenage girl next door, you know, like we don't think local. So I really love that you offered that question of what will, what will make, what will help life flourish? You know, like what will bring the most flourishing? Um, so I think that will give us some clarity on how we can be peacemakers when we vote. So I, I wonder too, if I could jump in on that, um, if that's a bit of a guard, because even as I'm, as I'm hearing us talk, it's like, okay, What's, how does it distinguish if we have these kingdom values we want to integrate into our votes? At what line do we start bumping up against this religious form of nationalism that mm. becomes destructive where we start to think that the way we vote or the way that our politics do their thing is actually synonymous with how God is doing God's thing? And that has been prob- problematic historically. And so it, I feel like we have to we have to offer some nuance here. And I think Shane, what you said about politics is damage control rather than politics as God's will in the world is an important theological starting point um, that allows us to have a bit of a governor on how much allegiance we give to a nation state or to a politic or to a candidate. Um, Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you talk about that, like how do we show up in the public square with these convictions without it becoming just another version or maybe a progressive version of Christian nationalism? Mm. Yeah, I, I take a lot of cues from uh, Dr. King and the civil rights movement on this. And one of one of Martin Luther King's um, powerful, uh, it is a quote, but it's more than a quote, right? It's, it, it's, it's like a, a fundamental principle was that he said this, Dr. King said, the church is not meant to be the master of the state or the servant of the state. The church is meant to be the conscience right yes and and that's where we get it wrong where we yeah. think oh we're just the church the state you know or, or you you give this kind of blank check to government that uh it's you know romans 13 is every you know yeah. authority is ordained by god you go no nah, i'm not so no. sure about that you know <laughs> yeah i can yeah. think of a few a few uh times where governments were way out of line with what god ordains and wills um and and so um but on the other hand you know, so we don't want to be walked on by the state, but also I think uh, the, the opposite is true. You have a lot of folks that are trying to take over power, yeah. right? And they're trying to lead, not like Jesus led, but they're, they're trying not to lead with a towel washing feet or with a, mm-hmm. uh, you know, with a, with a cross of, of love, even for our enemies, but they're, mm-hmm. they're trying to take the sword and the gun. And um, we literally have politicians who have said, if Jesus had had an AR-15 instead of a cross, this story might have ended differently. And you're like, "Woo, that's some major messed up going on right there, right? Mm-hmm. So when we craft Jesus into whatever we need in order to justify our pursuit of power, that's, that's uh, toxic. I mean, it contaminates the gospel, right? Um, right. And, and um, so, uh, and, and I think even how, how Dr. King differentiated between the holy work of God to heal broken hearts personal salvation, we might say, right, mm-hmm. it is, it is linked to God's heart to heal the world for social transformation. So a way that Dr. King named that was he said, 
a law cannot make you love me, but it can make it harder for you to kill me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Isn't that true though, right? Like, yeah. so, because people will say, oh, no, a lot, you know, laws don't do everything. That's true. They don't do everything. They, they can't change a racist heart. Uh, yeah. A law can't make a violent person nonviolent. Um, but what we can do is restrain people's ability to carry out their racism and violence and to hurt other people. And for instance, with gun violence right now, we're making it real easy uh, to kill people. And, and uh, you know, it's not just going to be laws alone. Um, I mean, we could get rid of every gun, which, uh, mm -hmm. but, and people will still turn a, a car into a weapon and drive it into a crowd, or they'll turn a pressure cooker into a bomb, as we saw in the Boston Marathon, right? Mm -hmm. we'll, we will find ways to kill people. But the fact is, what's unique about America when it comes to our homicides and even our suicides is, um, is access to guns. I mean, yeah. you know, like every country in the world has a sin problem, uh, a heart problem. Uh, but we we um, allow sinful people access to weapons of mass destruction, you know, uh, mm -hmm. military style weapons that are designed for one purpose uh, to kill as many people as possible, as quickly as possible. And, you know, I think that's what really sets us apart when it comes to the rest of the world and yeah. our own our own domestic violence. <sighs> Okay, so I, I want to kind of talk a little bit about gun violence because I, you offer a you offer a unique um, expertise, and you can help us understand how to do some of that harm reduction or damage control when we go to vote during the midterm elections. Okay, so wh what are some of the ways that people can engage with their ballots this year that like honors the loss? to gun violence and 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 does our best to kind of turn the tide on access to guns and reduce the the fear that so many of us have i mean my kids go back to school on monday and I, this sunday at our church i'm leading our church in our back to school benediction sunday where we bless all of our kids in their backpacks and i'm sitting here thinking how do i with a room full of preschoolers all the way to high schoolers how do i bless them to go to school yeah. but also say in a way that doesn't scare the kids, but mm -hmm. also addresses the parents' fear that like, we're praying, we're praying for your protection, yeah. you know, because we know that school shootings are a reality now when we send our kids off to school. So how do we engage with gun violence as voters this election mm. season? Yeah, well, well first, I, it is such a good question. And I think it's, it's one of those things that we gotta be careful not to be too um, uh, dualistic in this and saying, Oh, you know, it's only about policies and voting or it's only about prayer. I mean, I believe in prayer. I still yeah. got a Pentecostal charismatic side of me and I can't hide it. Hallelujah. Uh, glory. Uh, but I also <laughs> when people say all we can do is pray, they're wrong. Yeah, uh, we, we yep. can pray. Uh, but then God's given us a lot of tools. You know, m one of my uh, mentors said, uh, when you ask God to move a mountain, God might hand you a shovel. Mm -hmm. And the fact mm -hmm. is that prayer can also become a place to hide yeah. from responsibility. Yeah. And I think it was Miroslav Volf that said, uh, it must defend God when we ask God to do what God's given us the power to do. You know, mm -hmm. so sometimes we're throwing our hands up at God and saying, God, why don't you do something? And God's saying, I, I made you like literally you are have the power entrusted by me to change some of these things yeah uh, so when it comes to guns um i believe that this is something that we always need to be praying for the victims of gun violence um praying for our, the healing of our streets on our front door it said we have a, a beautiful mural that says heal our hearts heal our streets heal our world oh god so we're praying that every day you know um but then I think we've got to ask what, what might we have the power to do? And um, I'm excited about this because I think um, there are lots of things that we can do that would save lives and still not get in the way of those who believe in the Second Amendment and the right mm -hmm. to, to bear arms. For instance, I'm going to give some real concrete examples because I think we need that. Great. Um, Let's go. And, and by the way, many of these things I'm throwing out there, um, 
two thirds of gun owners believe, uh, agree mm. with two thirds, <laughs> and th- th- sometimes up to 80% or 60%, depending on which one. But listen to this, a limit to the capacity that guns could shoot. Let's say 10 rounds without reloading. My friends that are hunters have a whole coalition of hunters against assault weapons. And they go, you just don't need more than 10 rounds to shoot yeah. a deer. Mm-hmm. Um, another law that I think would be a good one. So I, I think, you know, um, we don't have grenades on our streets. We shouldn't have military style assault r- rifles on our yeah. streets. Yeah. An- another one is what we call one handgun a month. Mm, okay. <laughs> it puts a limit on the number of handguns, handguns that one person can own to 12 a year, one per month. Oh my gosh. That sounds you, more than reasonable. Yeah, to that me. Is, yeah, that sounds excessive <laughs> to me. Why do you need 12 uh, handguns? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'll, and so who that's the question that so many gun owners also ask. Who yeah. needs more than 12 handguns? Someone that is selling handguns yeah. on the street or yeah. someone that has a problem and is not making the world safer. Right. Um, and so, you know, that's what, when we talk about common sense gun laws, that's the kind of thing that many of us are talking about, uh, requiring that stolen guns simply be reported, sometimes by gun shops themselves that have an astronomical amount of guns that are stolen, right? With I'm putting quotes on that, right? But mm-hmm. they're not required to be reported. So you can have guns disappearing all the time. You know, so there's, I mean, I think minors, right? A disproportionate amount of gun violence is 18 to 20 year olds. We don't trust them to buy a beer, but we're trusting them to buy an assault rifle. I mean, legally in some places, right? Yep. So those are the things. And, and just to step back a little bit, because I know this can be a, a heated topic, but I care about this because I care about life. Yeah. And we, 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 have, we have way too many kids that are getting killed on our corners in my neighborhood and all over the country, right? Yet uh, two days ago, we had a shooting with 49 rounds in one minute. A 25 year old was killed. Others were injured. Like, you know, so this is like the reality that many of us live in. And, um, and there's also, I, I wanna just name the fact that there's also a race dynamic to this. Yeah. This disproportionately affects people of color and communities that are under-resourced. So for years and years, guns, gun violence has been the number one cause of death of African-American kids. Yeah. Number one, it, they're 10 times more likely to die than white kids. But listen to this, in the pandemic, gun violence became the number one cause of death of all American children. So there's no, no, there's no yeah. way that you can say you're pro-life. <sighs> Yeah. And ignore and ignore gun violence, right? In my lifetime, I'll, I'll stop. I, I'm obviously passionate about this, but in my lifetime, we've had more lives lost to gun violence domestically than all the casualties of all of America's wars combined throughout history. So we, if we want to talk about peacemakers, I mean, yeah. I care about ending war. I care about abolishing nuclear weapons, all that. I mean, that's a fire in my bones too. But I also know that if, if we're going to live into Jesus's call to be peacemakers, blessed are the peacemakers, he said, yeah. then we, we've got to be the, the champions for life on all of these issues. And we should be the biggest advocates for gun violence reform, to, yeah. for laws that will save lives. So, yeah. uh, yeah. Okay. I just have a quick follow-up question because yes, I'm a hundred percent on board. Yes. I I'm a peacemaker. I'm against gun violence, all the things here is where I get a little overwhelmed or I feel a little discouraged when I think about gun lobbies and the NRA and just the amount of money and energy that is put behind protecting guns. Like can you speak some hope to that? (laughs) Or like, what would you say to somebody that feels like overwhelmed or discouraged a little bit like how I am? Cause I'm like, I a hundred percent want to vote for more gun reform, but I also feel like I'm bumping up against a mountain with these. Mm, What what would you say to that? So this is what I would say, Oshita. And I'm, I'm trying to find an exact stat here, but um, is that, the gun, so the NRA, this, this is why we say, this is what I say a lot, and I think it's really helpful for folks to, to um, 
distinguish this is that our problem when it comes to vi gun violence is our biggest problem is not gun owners, but it's gun extremists and gun profiteers. And the NRA, the National Rifle Association, represents, uh, I think, the most dangerous element of that. And, and the, the, because this is the uncompromising rhetoric of the NRA. If they come for our assault rifles, they're going to take our hunting guns, you know, and mm -hmm. all of this like fear mongering. And there's also a very deep racial part of this. So, I mean, if you yep. look at the NRA history, you see a group mm -hmm. that is, uh, I think, can... Uh, can really be defined as a group that um, is uh, a white supremacist organization from the board all the way down to the seats. Uh, and and mm -hmm. I, I sometimes say this, not everything in a McDonald's is a hamburger, but you don't have a McDonald's without hamburgers. And I think mm -hmm. in the NRA, not everyone is a uh, white supremacist in the NRA, but you don't really have the NRA without white supremacists. I mean, that's been the part that's mm. been kind of the, the, um, but I want to say this too, that the NRA, when they say we have 5 million members, what we need to hear is that what that means is that 95% of gun owners, 95% of gun owners are not a part of the NRA. And a majority of gun owners actually have said they find themselves at odds with the rhetoric and the ideology of the NRA. So we've got to push back on that narrative just a little bit mm -hmm. to say that um, now what the NRA has done well is they have engaged politicians to the yeah. point where they disproportionately um monopolize the narrative of guns and they own many of our politicians they don't even give all that much money um these days i mean they declare bankruptcy right but they do own somehow they have bought the politicians even though 90 percent of americans want to see change how do you hold back damn up 90 percent of americans that want change on gun laws you buy the politicians and that's what they've managed to do um, so we've got to, we've got to change that. You know, I, I think we, and I think we can, because we've got them, you know, it, it is a powerful little group uh, there, but we, you know, the people power, that's where, that's, if we are a democracy, that's, uh, that's what happens. And, yep. you know, just like water boils, not all at once, but it begins to steam and then you see little bubbles, you know, and then it begins to boil a little bit. I mean, that's what we see happening in our country right now. And you can't hold that back for too long. Hmm. Thank you. Jane. So let's, uh, let's talk brass tacks here because I think a lot of us listening are, this is super educational and information. Like the information is what we need. It gives us the tools to go to the voting booth to actually see that we have a peace, like as peacemakers, we have a responsibility to engage systems change. Yeah. Specifically related to gun violence, what you just described is so helpful and gives us a clue for what we're looking for when we open that ballot. A, a very, very felt need for many of us listening in is in a very proximate reality for many of us are the relationships uh, around us. And these are people we love. These is communities that have shaped us. And a lot of those people don't think the same way we, as we do on, on these issues. Um, so how do we take that fire, that zeal that you're bringing to us, these deep convictions, we would say these are our kingdom convictions, spirit led convictions and actions. How do we hold that and be ourselves? And at the same time, be people who are in relationship with those closest to us that think differently than we do. And, and what are some tools or practices related to that? I'd love to hear you interact with that a bit. Well, I'll throw out a couple of thoughts. So two, two on this is one, for those of us that love Jesus, we center Jesus. You know, G Jesus uh, uh, is the, the center of everything. Our, our sounding board for uh, how we think about immigration, how we think about health care, like all of that. I look at Matthew 25 and I see Jesus saying, you know, when I was sick, you took care of me. When I was in prison, you came and visited me. When I was a foreigner, an immigrant, a refugee, you welcomed me in. So I think we got to center Jesus. And, uh, you know, Reverend Barber, uh, who we, we 
do a lot with with the poor people's campaign you know he he says often when we take our eyes off jesus we end up focusing on things jesus didn't focus on yeah and we end up forgetting things that jesus never forgot so we we, we really got to talk about what jesus talked about and jesus yeah. talked a whole lot about the poor uh and the least of these uh widows and orphans and so who are those people in our society well they're the most vulnerable people so god cares not how the dow jones is doing but how the poor are doing. And that should be our litmus test, right? For how our how healthy our society is, is not the tax cuts we're given to billionaires, but what are the resources that we're given to those who have the least uh, in yeah. our society? Yeah. Um, and the second thing, so centering Jesus, I think mm -hmm. is, is so important. And yeah. when we're talking with family members, I mean, sadly, the obstacle on some of these issues, like the gun, uh, the gun violence and the death penalty, yeah. um, Christians are often the biggest supporters of the death penalty and Christians, white evangelicals in particular, are the uh, highest gun owning demographic in America. So we got to talk Jesus, you know, uh, can we carry the cross in one hand uh, and a gun in the other? You know, can we love our enemies, as Jesus said, and simultaneously prepare to, to kill them? Right. Uh, doesn't yeah. Jesus's command to turn the other cheek uh, stand in contrast with the NRA's rhetoric of stand your ground, right? Like, mm. so these things kind of butt heads yeah. Yeah. and we yeah. can't serve two masters. The other thing I would say, center Jesus is the first. And the second, as I, I would say, we've got to center the people who have been most impacted by these injustices, because mm. we have, we have a, a, a strange way of being comfortable talking about people we don't know. Uh, we have a lot to say sometimes about immigrants, but we don't know many. Uh, we might have a lot of things that we uh, believe about Muslims, but we might not know many names of Muslim friends. And that's the problem, right? Mm. So I, I think that um, as our friend, our mutual friend, you know, a dear friend of Global Immersion, Alexia Salvatierra says so often um, that sometimes what we have is not a compassion problem but a relationship problem. It's a yeah. geography problem, right? Yeah. Right. Um, so I don't know too many people that get argued into thinking differently. You know, they change their mind because they lost yeah. an argument. So right. I'm not going to waste a lot of a time arguing with people, um, mm -hmm. but I'm going to tell stories, mm -hmm. right? And I think we can story people in mm -hmm. differently. Mm -hmm. I mean, relationships are most transformative, but I think you can get people close to a relationship by telling a story like yeah. my friend James Coddington, uh, Coddington that I just was with on death row before he was executed. You know, folks can talk about the death penalty, but um, when I tell you, when, when you talk about someone that's faced execution or my friend Derek Jameson, who was wrongfully convicted and spent 20 years on death row was hours from his execution before the state was forced to admit that he was innocent because they had 30 pieces of evidence that they knew he was innocent. Jeez. Um, yeah. And so like, those are the stories that we have to center. Right. And then that, right. they create, they create a better conversation when we're not just talking rhetoric and ideology and stale talking points, but we're saying, listen, mm -hmm. you know, I hear what you're saying and that's got to come from somewhere. So I think we can ask mm -hmm. questions, you know, mm -hmm. wow. You, do you, do you really think that all immigrants are like the MS 13 or whatever, you know, like, yeah. like do yeah. you, don't you know some dreamers you know let me tell you about a few friends that i know that um that their narrative is very different from that kind of fear mongering that we hear they're they're actually not uh um well anyway i'm just gonna stop i'm not gonna repeat I, that, a former, <laughs> that a former president said no, <laughs> this, uh, it makes me think shane of um uh, years ago i was sitting with an um, imam in jerusalem in east in east jerusalem he was a muslim obviously Palestinian, and we were seeking to hear his perspective. And one of the most profound, it was a group of pastors that I had brought over there. And he looks at us and he says, you have to stop hearing about us and start hearing from us. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. what he was inviting yeah. us to was proximity. He was inviting us to the table. Mm -hmm. Stop reading all the headlines, start learning the stories and getting close. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, in that case, he was talking about Islamophobia and the way Christians were perpetuating it. But even in this political time, who is our political other and how might we do less talking about them and more talking to them mm. and, and close some of that relational gap and see how that informs our formation yes. and 
in their formation and see it as a mutual act of solidarity in that sense. Yeah. That's yeah. Good. When, when I was in Oklahoma, um, I was invited to talk to some of the members of uh, the state legislature there. So senators and Republicans in Oklahoma. And we prioritized conversations with Republicans because frankly, I mean, you, there's not going to be change on the death penalty and yep. um, mass incarceration without um, Republicans. And we talked about the Bible. We talked yeah. about grace. And, yep. and the, the wild thing is in this last execution, um, Governor Stitt, the governor of Oklahoma, his own clemency board uh, uh, voted for mercy. They voted a, that the execution not happen, and yet he went forward against that. So there are there are hesitations happening within these spaces, and I, I really believe someone that I disagree with on seventy five percent. If we can work together on the twenty five percent we have in common, the circles of influence are much bigger, and we can yeah. get a lot done rather than staying in our silos. And there's a yeah. lot of virtue signaling. There's a lot of self-righteousness sure. on both the progressive side and the conservative side. So, yep. uh, you know, I think we got to talk with each other and see, see if we can make some progress. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's a lot to think about. I mean, I will tell you that that I love the idea of learning from my political other I also want to acknowledge that in this conversation, we've talked about race and the power dynamics that that brings into it. And so I'm sitting here thinking, I don't know that, honestly, as a peacemaker, I don't know that I could be in a conversation with a, a white Republican who has bought into some white supremacist ideas. Yeah. Um, I don't know that I could sit in that conversation and really be able to tap into the love of Jesus because there's a part of me that feels like I need to be protective of it, yeah. of my own dignity. But I do see myself being able to sit with my father, who's a black Republican, and have a conversation and the and and kind of share different perspectives and learn why he holds, you know, that political like those political ideas. And because I think we have a shared experience as African Americans. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I totally, I love this, but I also just for the listeners, yeah, I would want to just offer that caution too to pay attention to some of the power dynamics that might be at play um, in those kind of conversations. I don't think, I don't think we're all called into every yeah. conversation. Do you think, do you agree or disagree, Shane? Like how, how does that land on mm -hmm. you? <laughs> Oh, I, I think that we can play all kinds of different roles. And there's yeah. people on the, here's what I would say, and absolutely agreeing with you, Oshita, is um, that courage has lots of different forms and shapes. And it looks different in a lot of different, uh, you know, to different people. Um, one of the folks that, that stood against the executions in Oklahoma was a, um, the former chair of the clemency board, he just came to the conclusion that he couldn't uh, vote for um, the death penalty and the governor asked him to step down. But it's the courage of all kinds of people that I think emboldened him, including Julius Jones's family yeah. um, and the whole campaign there. So, you know, I think of like um, uh, Bree Newsom taking down the Confederate flag in South right. Carolina. And I think of, Colin Kaepernick, you know, taking a knee and, and um, Rosa Parks, all the folks in history who their courage is, is what enlivens us and emboldens us. Yeah. So we, we do that for each other. And, um, and I, I, I totally agree with you that I think we can play different roles. And frankly, one of my African-American friends in Oklahoma said, I'm so glad you were in that room because they need some white faces mm. to talk with them. Mm -mm. And they, they will hear whether it's wrong or right, we can debate, but it, whether it's true, we can't, is that they yeah. will hear some things from me that they may not hear in the same way, the exact same things from my, my, you know, African-American brother. So, yeah. um, so anyway, yeah. you know, we, could, we could do a whole show on that. I think. <laughs> well, and, and John and, and John and I will have, John and I will have a conversation <laughs> about that because that's, yeah. But, um, no, thank you for that. And, um, I'm just curious, where can we continue following you? Where can we learn from you? Um, thank you for spending so much time helping us get our brain around how to be peacemakers around this issue of gun violence, which I feel like is so 
pressing for so many of us. So yeah. I, I feel some hope around that. So yeah. where can we continue following you? Well, we're all doing this work together, aren't we? But uh, we, we've got a great thing going at Red Letter Christians. I think that's where you can find um, uh, a lot of other wonderful voices of uh, folks that love Jesus and care about peacemaking and are doing really powerful stuff on the ground. And uh, Global Immersion is one of our, what we call co-conspirators, you know, mm-hmm. so um, redletterchristians.org. And uh, I'm on, you know, active on all the socials. Well, I'll show my age here. I'm working on the TikTok, but I'm on Instagram, <laughs> Twitter, and Facebook. And uh, I'm always looking for new friends, virtual or real. So thanks, y'all. Well, and real quick, before we let you go, we always like to ask our guests, um, especially, I know that you came into this call with a heavy heart, um, but I also know that you are a man of hope. And so what is giving you hope in the midst of all of the things that you are bravely facing and being a peacemaker in? Well, literally before the hour before I got on this call, I was, um, um, in our shop where we turn guns into garden tools. Um, mm. And, you know, it's uh, inspired by the prophets, uh, you know, they shall beat their swords into plows. And so we, we turn guns into garden tools. Um, it's therapeutic and holy for my soul, mm. but it also gives me hope because literally every time we do it, we are declaring that all things can be made new. Yes. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, sometimes I tell people, you know, I hold up a shovel and I say, this is what a gun looks like when it gets born again. Mm-hmm. And uh, not only do we believe that metal can be recrafted, but we believe that people are more yeah. than the worst thing that they've ever done. And that um, even someone who's killed another person, that they're, they're more than a murderer and that yeah. great grace can get the last word and God's love is bigger than our sins. I mean, we believe that. And I think that our streets can be made new. Our country mm. can be made new. The, the, the wounds of history and racism and violence run deep, but don't we believe that God's love runs even deeper? Amen. Mm. Amen. Grateful That's a for beautiful you, my friend. way to close our conversation. Oh my so God. Good. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for inviting me. I'm honored to be a part of the conversation. Hello, Everyday Peacemaking Podcast listeners. There's two things with Global Immersion we wanted to let you know about. First, this podcast would not be happening if it wasn't for our Embers community. This is a collective of folks from all across the country and the world who give money every single month to help fund our everyday peacemaking resources, like our monthly periodical called The Monthly Peace, our daily contemplative contemplative prayers, webinars, and this podcast. So uh, if you'd like to join this community of funders for five bucks a month or 500 bucks a month, we would be thrilled. You can follow the link in the show notes or go to our website, globalimmerse.org, to jump in on that. Second, we're about to open up applications for our 2023 leadership cohorts. Uh, These cohorts are designed for faith leaders who want to go on a journey of discovery in the intimate company of peers and trusted guides. We wanna do the slow, hard work that leads to healing and renewed vision for who you are and I am and how we will collectively lead restoratively in the church of the future. These cohorts include in-person retreats, online learning, coaching, and immersive experiences. One, uh, the Journey of Hope cohort culminates in a trip to Northern Ireland to learn from uh, other peacemakers in that global context and the other, Uh, Journey Home culminates with a pilgrimage on the Camino de Santiago where we seek to confront the conflict within ourselves that inhibit our ability to lead towards equity and justice and peace. So space is very limited. Jump on it and you can get more information and apply in the show notes or go to globalimmerse.org dash leaders. Oh my word, John. Oh my word. That was a raucous, a raucous ride, wasn't it? That was something else. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Like the Pentecostal came out of him. So uh-huh. we loved that. Um, yeah. So what, what, what would, what's your like big takeaway from that conversation with Shane? Well, I mean, it's, it's really hard to think of one, but I think for me, maybe it's cause I think about this so much, um, in my studies, but the way he was talking about that nuance between giving energy to the nation state um, 
without making an idol of it, like not yeah. moving towards Christian nationalism where we just pledge our blind allegiance to it and then say that God's hand is being, um, is moving through our political party. Um, but he, he quoted MLK, and I think it was so helpful, uh, mm -hmm. MLK's framework of uh, the church is not master or servant of the state. It's meant to be the conscious of the state. Mm -hmm. And that gives us the freedom to engage actively uh, and wholeheartedly without feeling like we need to take. It's not about power and mm -hmm. it's not about submission. It's mm -hmm. about fully living into our vocation as followers of Jesus in this society we happen to find ourselves in. And that was just yeah. really helpful. Like it gave me, yeah. it gave me some, some framework to hear the conversation in a way that's like, okay, we can get after this without feeling like we're kind of sliding down a slippery slope to just another brand of nationalism. Yeah. I'm just super wary of that. Yeah. So when he said that, it made me think of, there are two things that, that sealed the deal for me in moving toward the Anabaptist framework. The first was nonviolence and the other was empire critique. Mm -hmm. And when he said that, it made me think, yes, that's, that is my value of empire critique. Like I'm a, I'm a kingdom, I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. And it is my job yep. to critique and to call out what the empire is doing and empire does best, yep. which is cause death and harm and violence and oppression. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I love how he framed our responsibility as voters at critiquing empire, being the conscience of empire, yeah. um, and rooting it in love and flourishing. I appreciated that. Um, I also was really grateful when he responded to my kind of concern around the conversation, like the invitation to conversation and mm -hmm. acknowledging power dynamics. Yeah. As you know, that's a big thing for me of like, not all of us are called to sit across the table from each other and have conversations yep. just because of power dynamics, because of biases because of like racial trauma and harm and those are yeah. things that i think is important to keep in mind mm -hmm. when we're inviting people to be peacemakers and i love how he said there are lots of ways to be courageous yep. so maybe the conversation you're not called to be a peacemaker through conversation but you might be called to be a peacemaker and taking down a flag or mm -hmm. at the very least what we're all inviting people to do is be a peacemaker at the ballot box yeah so, yeah yeah was... so i was so i asked shane what a spiritual practice we could would bless our audience um because you know that i like to bring a spiritual practice to these conversations and he reminded us um to go to commonprayer.net right and check out the midday prayers and that's that's a practice that he really loves and you'd even mention too john that that's a practice that you and your community yeah, yeah. loves so that's that's what we are inviting you into is to go check that out commonprayer.net right john that's it. Yeah. I love it. I love it. <laughs> so as we say every week, uh, one, thanks for being with us. I uh, hope this was helpful. I know it was to us. And go to the show notes, go to our website, grab the free PDF with practices related to all the ways that we work for peace in this midterm season. Uh, so, so get over there. And with that, we want to send you um, with a blessing. May we be a people who engage politics, not as an idol, but as a proactive way to live out our values of the kingdom, even if it's just damage control. Okay. Amen. Much love, everybody. <laughs>